Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Deep Three podcast. Today's episode, Drew Adams of uh, Bradley University. Drew, thank you for uh, uh, coming on the podcast, and uh, I'm sure there's going to be some great information right here. No, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we've talked many times before, and uh, let's start with uh, one of the most impressive things is uh, turning uh, the program around at Bradley University, right? Like uh, we've talked before, and you said how you guys only had what, two two scholarship players when you came in. Um, so let's, let's let's touch on that, and, like your approach when you came in in April. It was late, uh, mm-hmm. you're signing players and rebuilding the culture. It's it's tough. Yeah, no, we got the job, and they had only won like five games and been in a little bit of a down cycle here at Bradley, even with a rich history, but down in the immediate past. And um, so we came in, we had like two scholarship players, like you said, and really had to rebuild the program. And it was April, you know. So we signed, um, and we decided then that we wanted to well, first establish a good culture and get our type of kids, even if that meant sacrificing maybe one or two wins this year for to have a better team down the line. Um, and we were going to get the best kids we could from wherever that was. And at, especially at that time in that first recruiting class, there was probably some better international kids still available in, you know, mid to late April and May than even American kids. A lot of the American kids, for one reason or another, had decided. Um, so we signed, I think, two um, – two European kids in that first class, one from the Netherlands and one from Great Britain that both ended up, you know, four years later being starters on our NCAA tournament team when we almost beat Michigan State in the first round. So that was, you know, a good, a great success for us. But the other thing is we didn't want to take a bunch of transfers or guys that had been in trouble in the previous schools right off the bat. And they've provided a lot of maturity to our program. You know, they had been around pros. They were, you know, Come, going across an ocean to play here and that they treated it like pros do and kind of brought the maturity of our team up even though on paper we were the youngest team in america nice well just a few things from there just they can take is one is just developing players right i mean mm-hmm. um you know taking guys from freshmen all the way you know to a team that you know by the senior year you know plays toe-to-toe to michigan state that says a lot about you know the, the progress they made uh you know during those four years, and of course, the, the recruiting jobs you guys did in the in the meantime with other kids coming in. Uh, but another thing is, you guys had success in like New Mexico, right? You, Drew, you had success there. Mm-hmm. And how was that uh, recruiting part? You know, uh, recruiting at New Mexico compared to recruiting at Bradley. Uh, what would you say are some of the differences? You know, be- between the Mountain West and the Missouri Valley Conference. And uh, your approach, you know, as coaches, uh, because uh, just from my past experiences in the NCAA, you know, playing the CAA, then moving the Patriot League, mm-hmm. um, it can be night and day. And it's not necessarily, it can be athletically, it can be X's and O's, mm-hmm. uh, it could be skill, uh, or it could be more of like a bold movement type league. To me, the Patriot League was really yeah. uh, all about uh, ball movement, player movement, uh uh, because let's be honest, okay, it was uh, when I was there, uh, was CJ McCollum was there, Mike Muscala was there, then I was there. Uh, so yeah. the four teams would carry the load a lot, but at the same time, um, not having the same talent, like let's say even at Bradley you'd have, or at New Mexico, or mm-hmm. then the coaches, I feel like they have to, to really focus on, on the X and O's. Like how can I get my guys open? You know, my guys cannot really isolate. So how do I get them? You know, if he's just a spot shooter or just an off-ball screen, like, they got to get creative. So what's the difference, like, as far as, like, you recruiting for those schools and also translating to the, the, the system of play? Yeah, um, system of play is a little – I thought that, um, you know, we've talked a little bit about it, but I thought in the Mountain West is probably a little more talented, a little bigger – little more athletic especially at the three fours and five they're a little bigger a little more athletic and sometimes even a little less skilled though um whereas the missouri valley though is an extremely extremely skilled league and an extremely well coached league like i mean compared to the big 10 a lot um fair i feel like called a little big 10 and i really do think the coaching in the missouri valley in my opinion not trying to get myself in trouble but yeah, i actually think the coaching in the missouri valley has been better 
Um, I think it's a little more skilled. And you have guys that have played basketball since here in the Midwest, you know, since they're about four years old and it's what all they know and their instincts are really good, their feel's really good. But the Mountain West probably had a couple more pros, like a couple more NBA players even each year than what the Valley. But the Valley, like, like a, you know, if you can't shoot in the Valley, they just don't guard you. They stay in the paint and guard the other four and you become a major liability where in the Mountain West kind of guys had their system. And if we pressure, it doesn't matter if you're a freak athlete or not, you know, we're, if you can't shoot, we're still going to pressure you. So, like, game planning, scattering report-wise, I, I think the Missouri Valley is just an extremely, extremely well-coached league, you know. Um, I've only been an assistant in the Mountain West in the Missouri Valley, but I was off the in, in a off the road spot, you know, as a GA in the SEC and in an ops, and I was director of operations in Indiana in the Big Ten. And the Missouri Valley coaching is as good as anywhere I've ever been. Just scouting reports, you know, skill sets, I mean, how they're going to attack you, you know, in-game adjustments, all that. Um, from a recruiting standpoint, you know, I thought the Mountain West, and it's probably why maybe they have a couple more pros, it's just wet, they're, you know, at west of Mississippi, really, there's a lot of land out there, a lot of people out there, and only the Pac-12 is, league is kind of based that way, so, you know, and then it's the Mountain West. Um, now, obviously, other BCSs can come steal guys from you, but geographically, there's not as many teams. Um, now, at New Mexico, uniquely recruiting-wise, is there wasn't a lot of in-state talent. That, um, so we were always going into someone else's backyard to recruit. And I think it made me a, even though it's a phenomenal job, but I think it made me a better recruiter too for whatever, come, you know, for Bradley and what in my future, because, you know, you were always going into, you know, San Diego State's backyard in California to recruit, or you're going to Colorado to recruit against Colorado. I mean, so that would be the difference out there with that, where um, and vice versa, it helped us though at Bradley because it's the opposite here. There's, uh, you know, we have talent in the Midwest, but there's also a thousand schools here that we're recruiting against uh, for all the same kids. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it's just even the East Coast. When I was in DC, it was just like mm-hmm. uh, like some like ten schools just like in that DC area. So for it's sure, crazy competition uh, for recruiting. You know, and, and uh, just to be seen live is nice. You know, all the time. Mm-hmm. I can imagine to the transition to New Mexico, but. How would you say travel wise or like what what is it like to travel as an assistant uh, for recruiting trips? I think people, uh, especially Europeans, I don't think they understand how grueling it is because I know I've had uh, I have a lot of friends that were assistant coaches. And uh, I just remember even during the season, sometimes they would leave at 6 a.m., try to make practice by 3 p.m. If not, they would be you know, the very next day on like the same 6 a.m. flight. It was like more like a 12-hour trip based, like recruiting trip during the season and during the summer when it's just booked sometimes. Of course, this is a crazy year, but usually, you know, you guys are on the road so much. Yeah, no, and especially when you're, I mean, when we were rebuilding the program, I mean, we were on the road constantly. We had to be, and, you know, you're blessed to be able to see lots of different parts of the country and world, but, you know, it's a lot, a lot of, 6 a.m. flights it's a lot of um you know late night flights like you said I mean there's many times you're flying into a city in the more in the morning and maybe taking the last flight out of that city that night so I mean it's it can be um a little bit grueling uh not that you're not blessed to be able to do that but yeah I mean it's you know and during the summer I mean you're in the 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 gyms for 14 straight hours sitting in the bleachers getting into a, a hot you know a, getting into your car driving to the next gym but I mean yeah I mean you're on the road a lot I mean like you know I'm blessed to have a great wife and stuff because you know during the <laughs> when it's recruiting season you know she sees me you know two days a week other than that you know she's pretty much on her on her own but you know it is a uh it's a very unique experience. I don't, you know, a lot of people see the limelight of it, but it's a lot, a lot of late nights. It's a lot of early mornings. You're, you know, you're out there by yourself a lot too. I mean, it's a lot of entertaining, that type of thing. Yeah, absolutely. I think for assistant coaches, it's actually one that's, to me, it's one of the hardest jobs. Um, just because on top of, you know, you recruit, you have to look at your opponents, you have to take care of your own team, uh, you know, development, everything else that goes along with it. So it's not, it's not just, uh, you know, once you get overseas, the pro side, you know, it's player development, mm-hmm. you know, X and O's scouting, of course. And, uh, but to me, the college coaching is, is really, really, really tough. And uh, how do you guys do with uh, the player development? Because, uh, you know, as we talked before, you guys have had numerous pros mm-hmm. coming, coming out of Bradley. Um, and you guys have been very successful, one with the international kids and two with the Americans uh, mm-hmm. also. No, I think our head coach, it's one of the things that 
he really prides himself on. He does a great job, you know, Brian Wardle. Uh, he was a very good player himself at Marquette. But and he's out there as much as any one of us assistants during you know during the year and in practice. But kind of how we do it is in the off season, we'll take um, we'll get with the player and say, hey, we're going to meet whatever coach does his position, you know. Coach Wardle, that coach, and him are going to meet. Hey, bring three things you think you need to get better at. You know, then if it's one of my guys, like position guys, me and Coach Wardle would meet and have three things. And obviously we're going to – whatever we think is best for that guy, kid we're going to do, but we definitely always try to integrate at least one thing, you know, that he thinks he needs to get better at. Because also when they're invested in it and it's what they want, you know, they might, might work a little harder at it. But – and we also – what I think is great and we haven't necessarily done in previous stop spots is we also give them one thing they have to get better off the floor. Maybe it's you need to spend more time with your teammates. You need to eat better. You, need, you know, you need to communicate better. You know, whatever it may be, um, you need to be a better vocal leader. You need to lead by example. So we try to give them one thing maybe non-basketball-wise or skill set-wise and then three things skill set-wise we're going to work on. And now we're always going to do, you know, catch and shoot threes or whatever. It's one of the most important things, I think, we believe in the game. It's just being, you know, so we're always going to do mass volume shots and stuff like that. But skill set will really break it down. And then once the season, uh, season comes, we don't stop doing individual development. We're going to do at least 30 minutes and 20 to 30 minutes in practice every day of individual development. Um, we're going to grab the, one of the coaches is probably going to grab them before or after practice to try to get another, you know, 20 to 30 minutes. And then we really watch a lot of film during season one-on-one -on -one with guys. Yeah, we always do the team stuff for scouting reports and our games, stuff like that. We also get all, you know, maybe it's a point guard. We're going to show him all his assists, all his turnovers, all his shots regularly and go over decision-making and stuff like that. So, you know, you get, you know, a 20-minute film session, 20, 30 minutes before or after practice, then during practice. So, I mean, even all season long, we're getting at least, you know, an hour – hour and 15 of individual skill-based stuff. And we're big believers that, you know, obviously the better we can get our guys, the better our team's going to be. So when we don't kill them in practice, you know, we the time we're in conference, we're probably only outside of the skill stuff. We might only go for an hour and then have about 30 minutes of that individual stuff. Um, so they are fresh. Uh, like I said, coach played. He knows at the end of the year they got to be fresh. And I think we played our best basketball at the end of the year, and that's why we've won the last two conference championships. Our guys have had their legs, they've, but yet they've gotten a lot better, and we're playing our best basketball then. That's awesome. And one thing I used to do, for example, uh, a little bit, I would say before my, my knee surgery, that was like, what, three years ago, um, I used to kind of just get the synergy uh, PDF files, you know, of, of my last season and kind of just go over it and it shows you right there what you're doing. You know, I think at some point, uh, one of my early years, I think my, it was my fifth year as a pro, I drove like 95% of the time I was driving left. <laughs> uh, it's just some stuff that you don't realize. Yeah, it's for matter. sure. Do you guys use that too as far as like some kind of just, hey, um, you know, so-and-so, you, you know, you're driving left, like, 90% of the time, we really got to work on, you know, do you driving right or whatever it is. Uh, do you guys use that kind of stuff too? Or just kind of like, you know, a coach's meeting is like, hey, we need our point guard to do this, this, this better. No, we definitely go over. Um, you know, we had a actually our uh, the kid from um, England that ended up having, you know, being a three or four year starter for us. I mean, he was a heavy, heavy, you know, right hand right hand driver right hand image and we really broke that down on synergy form and showed it to him on film and then you know and then broke down the numbers for him and he became a very you know a cape guy that was capable of going really well downhill both ways so we definitely use synergy a lot we look at the numbers like we also look at what they're good or really good or bad at like it's got you know you've seen it it's got spot ups or pick and roll handoffs like you know all that so we go over what you're good at what you're bad at and we'll break that down even during the year and just try to just move the needle a little bit you know just improve it a little bit make some small adjustments during the year to really help those guys out and then really dive in and focus on it in the offseason if it's a thing like you said where they're just not finishing going left enough awesome and i know you told me that uh you guys have you guys on campus now you know doing individual stuff and mm -hmm. just awesome it's good to hear give me some hope for my season too but uh, <laughs> um what was your approach during the the covid time where, of course, everything was online. Um, you know, you guys, of course, you can send them packages. You can tell them to do this, do that. But uh, not everybody might have access to a weight room in their basement or whatever because, you know, how it is. Uh, you know, I've been through it, too, um, where you don't have access to it or you don't have access to a hoop or 
they lived in the Midwest and it was cold up until like May. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. And what, then, what was your approach as, as coaching staff uh, during that time? Well, we tried to make sure that they just had, you know, they had workout sheets for basketball and they had, and I think our strength coach did a good job of giving them stuff, both they, of finding out what each kid, I mean, he might've given 13 different workouts during that time because he was giving, he was finding out what they had access to and then giving them stuff. You know, some of our guys may have just had their room at their house, you know what I mean? And so he gave them body weight stuff. And some of the guys had some free weights, you know, he gave them a little more. Um, so he kind of, you know, he kind of tailored some weight workouts just to, you know, it's crazy to say it was such a weird time, if nothing else, to at least maintain where they were. I don't know, you know, it'd probably be hard to make, you know, so a lot of them did a good job of maintaining where they were. And then, you know, they had some basketball workouts. But that's why we thought it was also so – a lot of our guys didn't have access to gyms. So that's why we thought it was so – we brought them back like the second week in June. And even though we weren't allowed to work with them yet by the, because of the NCAA rules, they at least had an hour they could get into the gym. They had an hour they could get into our weight room. And I, you know, heck, because here in the States, they were going down around even parks and taking the rims down because, they, you know, too big, too big of groups were playing at the parks. Um, so, but I thought, you know, and we really thought – is we're, you know, that it, even for their mental well-being, that was really important. They needed some sort of escape during, you know, th those crazy times to some normalcy and, you know, to exercise their bodies and stuff. So that's why we thought it was really great to get them back on campus. Even if we couldn't work on them, at least they could go into that gym with their teammates for an hour, or hour and a half. At least they could get into the weight room and lift some weights and exercise. And, that, and we knew they were, you know, we have guys from all different backgrounds, but we, we knew they were at least getting fed and that type of things here on campus. Gotcha. Absolutely. No, it totally makes sense. So uh, once they got back on campus, you said they were allowed to do a one hour work basically individually, then with the roommate and then yeah. one hour and then just the dining hall. Right. I mean, that was basically it. Huh? Yeah. They had about them and the roommate had about an hour in the weight room and they're in the roommate had about an hour and um, on the floor to work out with, you know, when we have the guns and, different things like that out there they can work. And then um, we were able, once they got back and they were in class in June, we were actually able to give them scholarship money too so they could also um, pay, you know, buy groceries, buy food, that type of thing. Gotcha. Yeah, it's a very complicated time because I still know, you know, like states that are not open completely. Mm -hmm. or like, so I really wonder how it's going to affect, you know, next season's uh, college basketball Cause like I said, your guys on campus in June, I think, uh, I was talking about St. Mary's, uh, head coach and assistant coaches, uh, earlier this month. And, you know, they're like, uh, I think they're trying to get them back on July 6th. So every school is just going to be different. I think Michigan, uh, uh, Michigan's kids are not allowed on campus yet. So it's just, uh, mm -hmm. I wonder how it's going to affect it because, you know, gyms are not open yet. They're not allowed to be open, at least in Michigan. Uh, I know Indiana is different, for example, and like they even play AAU tournaments. So it just seems like it's different countries that are like within the U.S. right now. I feel like every sure. state is a different country. Yeah, no, it's wild. I mean, some of the states are full blown having tournaments, and then some of the states, like you said, Michigan or California, no, they're not allowed to have anything open. You know what I mean? So yeah. it's very different right now. And you know, all I can do is hope we, I hope we can. I think we got a good group this year. I hope we, everyone, it's safe to tip here in November, but. I don't think anybody really, you know, you hear something different every day. And, um, you know, we get different rules from the NCAA every day on what we're allowed to do or not do, really. No, absolutely. I'm sure you guys were disappointed since you were basically in the NCAA tournament this year. And mm -hmm. uh, you're again ready for, for another March Madness. And uh, it's uh, not an easy time to be to be a, a college coach, I tell you that. Uh, we are talking about recruiting earlier, but now it's even harder. Like, let alone just trying to get your kids better, you know, trying to – Trying to recruit now, I think that's a uh, um, really, really big thing. Um, what was your approach to, to recruiting during this time, the last three, four months? Well, luck, I mean, we were in a little bit of a fortunate spot. We only have um, two scholarships in 2020, uh, a couple scholarships in 2021, and I can't talk about individuals in that just because of the rules. Yeah, okay. But in, but we were watching tape, a lot of tape on guys, making a lot of phone calls, a lot of Zooms. And what I can talk about is we still had – two 2020 um, uh, scholarships open right when this started. But fortunately, there were two kids we were really far down the lo uh, line in and with uh, Sean East and Jason Kent. I mean, two kids here in the States, one from Indiana and one from Chicago, both Midwest kids. So we were able to – we got them wrapped up, you know, luckily 
within two, three weeks, you know, they were pretty sure they wanted to come here and they made their decisions um, right when the started. I mean, there were some schools that I would not have wanted it to be year one when we got here. There was two scholarships during this, this time and everything would have been had to be done on film and Zoom. And I just think it's too easy. Um, I think the in-person interactions is just so important to at least have at some point in the thing not just for us, but for the student athletes too. And just all that was pretty much taken away once this happened. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, talking about, you know, when you mentioned that you didn't, you didn't wish to be this year one, um, what do you do with your foreign kids right now? Well, our, uh, uh, our, we have a kid from the Netherlands, Rick Mast, who stayed here in this, this country. Um, we have a kid from a, uh, Africa as well, who stayed here the whole time. You know, they didn't want to risk going uh, going home, which I think obviously, as you see, everything's played out. It's probably really smart. Um, they stayed here and just worked. The NCAA did grant us some flexibility to help take care of them a little bit, even when uh, all this was going on because they couldn't leave. Um, we have a Canadian kid that, you know, that border's a little different. So he went home for about a month and came back for summer school. We also have a guard from Finland that had a great, great freshman year this past year. Um, and, uh, you know, me and you have joked about him. I mean, he missed, I think, you know, he's second leading scorer in the European championships, uh, coming in. He's a great player, comes in and misses like his first 20, 22 threes when he got here in front of about 6,000 people. But I mean, talk about mental toughness, you know, and credit to our head coach too. I mean, he was in the gym with them, rebounding for him, shooting with them, you know, played through it. And, you know, he ended up shooting 40 something percent from three. You could take away those first 20 shots. He's probably in the fifties and had a great season for us, helped us win the conference tournament. Um, but he went back in Finland to finish up his military service, so he's actually back home. Uh, so hopefully, you know, that we're allowed to, you know, he's allowed to come back here sometime in uh, August. Yeah, it's such a delicate time. Um, I know so many kids overseas are like, oh, I don't know what to do. Uh, especially, I, would, I wouldn't want to be a senior in high school right now, you know, trying to no. come to my senior high school, or am I going to stay there, or – um, you know, just what's going to happen. Um, as of now, uh, what are your recruiting plans for like this fall since some states are different or you just kind of go based week to week, month to month? Is that type of situation? Right now, it's really just month to month. I have, you know, um, right, we're dead. They've canceled all recruiting through August. Uh, right now, it's it could open up in September. A lot of people think it's even going to get shut down through September. Um, as soon as it's open, you know, there's some places we definitely already know that we want to go. Like, hey, as soon as mid-September, October, November, whenever it may be, we're going to go, you know, go to these places and see these kids. Um, but right now it's just um, – I think the NCAA is meeting about every Wednesday, I think, is when they meet on the rules through, through this, you know, crisis or the pandemic. And, uh, yeah, so we're just really waiting. We're canceled through August. Sounds like we're probably going to be canceled through September. Um, but then hopefully we can, you know, get out after that. Because like you said, if you're a senior and in that 2021 class, I mean, you had the end of your high school season taken, you know, taken away last year. You had all – you had either AAU or the European Championships or whatever you may play in if you're overseas taken, you know, taken away. So they really haven't had um, maybe the opportunities that every other class before them has had. So hopefully – you know, we can do, you know, the NCAA can do some things to help those uh, student athletes. Absolutely. It's, it's going to be very interesting. Um, I wonder, and I'm gonna, definitely going to follow this, you know, the transfer situation of this freshman coming in because, you know, with only of uh, Zoom meetings and, uh, you know, online meetings and all this stuff and uh, maybe coaches not getting seen in live, you know, how is that going to work out long term uh, for these kids? It's, it's really going to be uh, – a tough situation, I think, for coaches, you know, offering scholarships, of course, and then for kids and parents trying to make the best decision for themselves in the future without being able, you know, like you said, to be face-to-face -face with someone and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Drew, last part I don't want to talk to you about. Uh, you guys clearly have a lot of international flavor uh, to your program, and you had it from day one since you got to Bradley, right? And uh, mm -hmm. what is your approach with the international kids as far as recruiting um, and helping them transition uh, to a new country, a new culture. Uh, because to me, that's one of the delicate parts of bringing kids in. You know, they might be really good basketball players. Uh, but like we're talking about, you know, your kid from Finland, um, you know, he's clearly a good player. Came sure. in, you know, missed some shots. Um, different coach might have benched him and could have lost him for the whole four years. Mm -hmm. uh, such a delicate situation, bringing kids over where, 
it might not be about skill translating. It might just be about them adjusting off the court, which allows them to, you know, just feel comfortable enough to play their best basketball. Mm -hmm. No, I think it's a lot of a lot of things I could say, but I mean, I think first and foremost, bias. I think it's why that is a good reason why, you know, when you're if you're international kid it's good to go play for someone that's had other international kids from the simple reason they at least know those adjustments a little more like coach world is a phenomenal that finnish kid i think finished he was in the, uh he finished every game for us i think in the conference tournament it was great and that's three games to win a championship go to the NCAA tournament he was he was finishing in, in there at the end of every game and played great in the conference tournament and like you said it could have been easy to lose him but I think all freshmen get better during the freshman year. But I think international kids improve even a lot more than maybe American kids, everything being equal, ask because they're getting used to a lot more. That's the only reason I say that. Like they gotta get used to the food, they gotta get used to maybe the athleticism, to living away from home. You know, some are used to big crowds, but some aren't. Some aren't used to playing in front of, you know, six thousand people every night. Like so there's just so much, the nutrition, all that, you know, they're getting used to. And they can make big gains, but you got to, you know, got to help them through that. You know, culturally, it's, it can be different. You know, so there's a lot of adjustments. It's not just, hey, I'm away from home for the first time. Uh, so I think you got to do a good job of, for one, expecting that because it doesn't matter where you're from, America, Europe, Australia, wherever, like it's going to be different in college. It's going to be harder than what you expect. You don't sometimes you just don't know what you don't know. Um, and no matter even if you're the best, you know, no matter how good you are, there's going to be some some adjustments and you just got to be ready for that. But you have to have a staff or at least it helps if you have a staff, too, that's been through that with different kids and can, you know, and kind of guide you through it, too. Yeah, absolutely. And just from, from my own story, I can tell you that emotionally, I think I went through that transition my sophomore year when I first came to high school here. And then I think. Um, it was it was definitely not easy. You know, I was living about like two hours from from school at St. John's, so it took me four hours just to get to high school and back. Uh, it, it was just tough. It was grueling. Um, yeah. And it comes, uh, you know, a time where basically question why you're here, why you, you know, and I think every international student goes to that. Mm -hmm. uh, no matter if you come in from uh, like I said from Finland straight here, and then you start for Bradley and you're playing well, you're not playing well, whatever it is, you're going to go through some struggles. You're going to hit a wall. Is the same rookie wall they're talking in NBA is the same everywhere. I think it's the same. If you're a rookie and you go overseas, you're going to hit the same wall at some point. And uh, one thing I like you were just saying, it's important that you play for players that had international uh, uh, for coaches that had international players before. And uh, I think that played a, a big role for me. Uh, you know, I went to George Mason, and then when I transferred, uh, just things were not working out. Uh, I think in America, they had a lot of uh, – Coach Jeff Jones had a lot of foreign kids before me, a lot of Lithuanians, a lot of – so as soon as I got on campus, you know, like I had the option to go to NC State, go to ACC, you know, transfer. Like I had the option to go to Lehigh, Purple, CJ McCollum. I had the option to go to Boston, Denver. It was, it was a lot of options on the table. And, like, once I got to American, though, it just felt like there was some kind of connection because he knew – he kind of understood the, the emotional side of things too for a foreign kid being here and like what they need, um, you know, to kind of just be helped and be pushed and how to be pushed and all this stuff. And um, just because it's a huge cultural shock. So like if, if, if you guys haven't dealt with a, with a foreign kid before, you kind of got to know like where to grab them, you know, like uh, culturally, uh, mm -hmm. grab their attention, how to grab their, uh, you know, how to, how to make them buy in, uh, which is something honestly that I felt like, uh, for me at, at Mason, like I bought in the, the first year and then the second one, I kind of felt lost. And like, I felt like no one kind of grabbed me and mm -hmm. like, buying to a, this new team to what happened, like what's happening and kind of explain you like, uh, because all these foreign kids, especially I come play D1, I think their end goal is to play pro, right? For sure. And yeah. they come here. It's, it's, it's yeah. to see it. If you're a foreign kid and you want to play Division One, I, I think Division Two, Three, like they come for other purposes. But Division One, to me, I think it's just I want to become a basketball player. Right. So I I the coaches understand that, and you mm -hmm. guys clearly do that at Bradley. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's huge. It's it's uh, it's it's part of why I feel like I was lost at Mason because like I'm like guys, I'm not playing. I'm playing like 80 minutes a game as a sophomore, <laughs> and I'm really trying to play pro. Like there was not a how can I get there. It was right. Like, Oh, right now I'm kind of figuring out. I'm like, well, I can't. I don't have the time. They have to see the. You have to be able to see a path to your dreams or your pro career. 
Like, you know, not saying you're never going to struggle, but you got to like, show you got to show the student athlete that there, hey, there's a path to your dream, and we we see your path. We're going to help you. You know, we're going to help you get there and recognize it. Absolutely. That to me, that was the best part. You know, you, you get best of both worlds. You know, you, you want to, of course, you want to become a pro as a foreign kid, and you also get a great education that can help you later down the road, mm-hmm. uh, whatever wherever it is in the world. Actually, you know, just to, especially we're talking like uh, an American or Bradley. You know, it's like. The private schools were very well known, and uh, it's not uh, it's not easy to get a scholarship there. <laughs> you know, just as a student, right? Sure. Yeah, no, no doubt. I mean, we we try to t- you know really take pride in that and make those guys comfortable. And you know, I think it's Pure is a very diverse community because actually Caterpillar, which is a Fortune 500, here's in town too. Bradley's a diverse school, so it's been a really a you know all around a you know a great fit for our city, our school, you know. Our, 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 our staff. Yeah, absolutely. And I look forward, you know, I said, I, I want to visit. I know when. I think. Yeah, we can't wait. Absolutely. Next summer, you know, now <laughs> like about three weeks left, but uh, next summer I'll, I'll, I'll certainly be there. Uh, definitely want to see the campus and everything else. Uh, I had a few friends that went to Bradley. Uh, oh, that's know, great. Way, uh, way ahead of time. Uh, but the last thing I want to talk to you again, uh, we, we've mentioned quite a few times this, this episode, how you guys turn pro. Mm-hmm. And uh, I know you guys have a certain system defensively where you want to switch one to four. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you have a certain type of big. And clearly that affects your recruiting, right? I mean, mm-hmm. hey, we want this type of point guard. We want this type of shooting guard, right? I mean, it's – it's mm-hmm. how open are you as – like, um, of course, if it's a five-star recruit, you can always be like, <laughs> we'll make an adjustment, you know. Like, hey, you're a first-round pick. We're going to have to make it happen. Um, uh-huh. But when it comes down to wire, let's say, you know, somewhat similar kids, what are some of the, uh, I'll say, the, the, the thin line, the differences that you've, uh, you know, between offering a scholarship and not offering a scholarship? Uh, because sometimes, you know, it's a thin line. It's your option one, option two. Uh, you know, what are some of the, like, intangibles that you guys think that, you know, you got to have if you want a scholarship at Bradley, for example? Well, we have a, you know, kind of a li- list of things we go over when we're recruiting. But I would say if the two kids were really equal, one of the first – the first two things I guess we would look at for sure is if they were close is we would look at, you know, their intangibles as a person. Like, are, you know, what type of kid are they? How hard do they work? Do they want to get better? Are they going to do what they're supposed to do off the floor? You know. And then two would be their feel for the game. Like if two kids are equal – or not equal, but two kids are at, you know around the same talent. And we would rather take the kid with the better feel for the game, which sounds like common sense, but that's not always the case. Some people would rather take the athlete. Some people would rather take the guy with better size, or you know whatever it may be. Or uh, but you know we would rather you know we look at intent, what type of kid he is first, and then uh, feel for the game would be um, would be second because I think the more guys you have out there that can make decisions. Uh, decision making, feel for the game, whatever you want to call it, but do that at a high level, the better everybody looks. And like you said, you know, first off, if they're really talented, we'll adjust the system. <laughs> but you know, we want to switch. We want multiple ball handlers on the floor. We want to switch one through four. Uh, we would like you know big athletic rim protecting fives that can you know protect the rim, guard pick and roll, dunk, kind of your modern you know modern five men there. But then one through four, we like to be able to shoot, push the ball. You know, we'll really let all of them, if they're capable, come, you know, push the ball off a missed, missed shot or come off a pick and roll because we'll play four out, one in most of the time. So really those are, you know, kind of the things uh, we look at within the system. Got you. Well, uh, that says a lot about, you know, why your guy transi- why your guys transition with all the pros, for example. And uh, I like to watch a lot of college basketball, and there's some good programs out there that just – the kids cannot translate, you know, or it takes them longer to adjust the pro game just because of the way they played in college. Uh, you know, I mean, to me, like, or always Syracuse has been a question mark as far as like getting guys overseas. Of course, you know, when you got the mm-hmm. Carmelo's and Hakeem Morix and all that stuff, <laughs> I'm not talking about those guys transitioning anywhere, you know, it's like, <laughs> right. <laughs> they're amazing. Uh, you know, but I feel like in the past, some of the guys uh, struggle adjusting the European game. Um, you know, just they never touched the ceiling that you thought they had or um, – and I wonder if it's – is it because of that zone that they used to play? Right. What is it? Is it the, the offensive? It's just, it's just something like that that mm-hmm. uh, plays a huge part in it. You know, when you come out of school, it's not going to be Bradley versus Syracuse. It's going to be like, 
how did, can this guy fit my system? You know, what kind of system sure. in college? Is it anything similar to what I'm doing here as a pro coach? So it's, um, you know, all that stuff is, is very important. Well, Drew, uh, really, thank you very much for your time. Uh, you know, it's been great information. Um, I hope our Thanks. listeners love it, and uh, we'll certainly stay in touch. For sure. Thanks a ton, and you know, good luck on your season, too. Thank you. Thank you, Drew. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.